Hello, friends and lovers, and welcome to my new series, a relaxing, long-form discussion and observation and reflection on being an independent performance artist, a day in the life. So we're going to start with my Tuesday, my Tuesday of February 27th. So this is this thing that I've been doing these days. I have been waking up. It's a thing I used to really do in the pandemic, like big time. I would wake up and I would journal. So I'm writing in my journal here in this video and it's something that I think is really important to do in the morning. Some people do morning pages. I really don't believe in the artist's way. I think she's like a privileged sort of like 1%, like she owns horse. I don't really get her. I don't think that she's someone <laughs> that people can learn, that working class people can learn a lot from, but that's a different discussion. This is simply a journal entry that I am doing in the morning. I, I could talk about anything and I try to give myself just like even five minutes. And I suppose it's the same thing as morning pages. You could also journal at night. But for me, what this means is just like, it's a moment to get to reflect on your feelings, either from the day before or about the day ahead or, you know, what, what have you. And in the pandemic, I would do this very passionately because I was always home and around and like, I didn't have anything to do to stop me. <laughs> There's nothing stopping me from doing this. And now I kind of have to enforce it. And because I work from home, typically this is part of my seven to 8 a.m. ritual actually is doing some journaling, which is very important and I'm very proud of and happy to do. Now, what you don't see here is that I am potentially already starting to feel the anxiety, the anxiety about what I need to get done. Writing about my negative feelings is healthy for me, but it also is like, can be toxic, right? And you're like, oh my God. So anyway, there's, there's that for us to un unpack, if you will. We continue actually with reading a book. This is another part of my seven to 8 a.m. ritual is like, I need to read a book. And I, I love to read. Reading is really important to me, but I'm not often able to build it into my schedule. And there's a number of reasons for that. Complicated reasons that we all have a lot of work to do and we're all overwhelmed about the workload. So today I actually was reading Clit Notes by Holly Hughes. And it's an awesome collection of her sapphic sampler. It's a collection of her writing. It's She's got wonderful anecdotes before and after and in some of her plays and she's just wonderful. I really am grateful that I got to spend this time with her and I finished the book yesterday so I'm glad that I got to take the time to read it and to go back to like as a theater artist you know like like who are some of our queer icons and one way to honor our queer icons, of course, is to read them <laughs> and, you know, feel, spend time with them in, in that way. Reading someone's book always feels like spending time with them, especially when it's, there's so many personal aspects of it. So highly recommended. It's really great. And also you'll notice I do stop sometimes during this, this period, not only to um, cuddle with uh, Grogu, but also to drink water. And drinking water is also a really important part of the 7 to 8 a.m. morning ritual for an independent artist. What you don't see here is my sort of like skimming through these pages, understanding, understanding that she's part of the NEA4, meaning that like her funding got cut from the National Endowment for the Arts due to conservative administration. But I don't understand and she never says. She talks a lot about being poor, about barely being able to afford making art, but she never says anywhere in the book how she got the NEA funding to begin with. Like what happened. What is the story, Holly Hughes? Would love to know because I'm completely jealous. <laughs> and we continue. So wrapping up our uh, morning 7 to 8 a.m. ritual, we're just gonna stretch it out. We're going to um, take a moment to recognize that it is probably already after 8 a.m. and there's a lot to do in your little day, Siobhan. So let's begin it Let's like stretch it out and let's consider, you know, um, getting up out of the physical bed. After hydrating, 
of course. So now we're beginning a part of the day that's another very important ritual. We've had some water at the bedside, so now we're moving on to collect and fully prepare our lemon water. So part of what I'm doing this month as an independent creative, I'm trying to get some sense of control over my life, is a uh, we're doing a 28 day fasting challenge. And we'll see if I continue to make this a part of a practice of my life, but I, um, I needed something. I, I've been to Paris, I have had a lot of anxiety. Things have been um, stressful. So I'm doing like a, some days it's a 12-12, some days it's 10-13. Today in particular, I'm doing I think 10 hours on and 14 hours off of intake, taking in calories. So lemon water is supposed to be really good for your digestive tract, your digestive system, really healthy stuff to do, you know, as well as this Palo Santo that is taking me a minute to light and air out my room and my space and just get some healing vibes going. We really obviously need to have some, some healing vibes in our lives as we move towards preparing the apartment, which is, there's a lot going on. I live in a studio. Probably by the end of this video, you will see my entire studio. But in this space is, I'm moving my furniture around because I am gonna do my workout, my morning workout at 8 a.m. Now, I'm using an app called Better Me. I'm not endorsing Better Me. I'm still actually the friend, the, the, the I, I'm not sure yet how I feel about Better Me as, as an enterprise, but it does have at-home workouts. It's an entirely at-home workout-based app, which is something that myself as a person who works from home, I really need it and I like to start my day with it. And it's kind of working for like the fasting plus the workout at from home mode on this app because I, I like to get my workout done in the morning because I like to kind of get ready for the day afterwards. So I really need to, you know, get this done early. And that also works for fasting because we are taking certain hours off of calories and I don't like to work out after I've had food and I'm very sensitive like that. So here we go. You're not going to see my workout because I only have one phone, like most people. <laughs> and uh, my workout is on the app on the phone. I suppose I could put it on my iPad, but I would have to remember to charge my iPad. That would be a completely different thing for me to do. So, you know, part of the creative practice is getting your workout in, right? It's like feeling better in your body, in your bones, and moving around and feeling, you know, alive. What you don't see is that I have body issues. I work out because I'm constantly stressed about my weight and my size and how I look and how people think I look and what I look like and if I look good, if I don't look good. I'm obsessed with the problems that I feel like my body has physically. It's a dysmorphia issue. It's an issue that I have been socially conditioned to have. I've had it for a very long time and that's just, that's a fact. So in addition to not sharing my workout with you, I have also spared you the shower aspect of my day as well as the fit change. So with the camera in between being off, we have changed a costume and we've also had a shower and I've put away the things from the workout. So you have to return the apartment back to its state. And what I'm doing here is listening to a podcast while I am putting on my makeup. I also listen to a podcast while I'm doing my workout. The podcast that I listened to yesterday was uh, Heavyweight. I absolutely love this podcast. It's my favorite podcast. Um, the season has uh, concluded, uh, the most recent season, but I'm actually going back and listening to previous episodes. So I'm going to binge the entire series of all of the seasons and I really recommend my creative empaths um, get into Heavyweight because it's incredible. And you'll see here that I am now doing my makeup, a big part of my day, even if I'm not going out anywhere, which as it happens this Tuesday, I am not going anywhere. I am going to be home all day and I'm still doing my full makeup just because it makes me feel present and alive and activated and focused, ready for if something were to come up. We always want to be ready in case something were to come up. I feel that when I have my like face on, I'm ready for things and it's sort of, again, part of the ritual, part of the practice of being, you know, being who I am and how I share myself with the world as a, as a creative. And I'm remembering to turn around and actually share myself and what I look like here with you, which is vulnerable, I guess. <laughs> 
and she's ready. So the fascinator, the whole look is, is complete. So we're good to go. Now, we're by good to go. I mean, we're going to sit in this chair that I'm sitting in here today, this Wednesday. We're sitting in it on this Tuesday. We're sitting in the chair. So we're going to settle into the work mode of this particular performance artist. Now, probably a lot of people do. If you are an artist, you do know that a lot of your work is admin. If you are not an artist, you might be surprised. You might think that as a creative person who creates experiences that I perform, you might think that I spend a lot of my time, I don't know, rolling around on studio floors and crying into notebooks of feelings, maybe playing with paints, maybe, I don't know, frolicking about, you know, cities and fields and having adventures and, and reflecting. I mean, the, the, all of these are mildly true, but also not mildly true. Oop, fix your posture, Siobhan. Fix your posture. Why do you sit like that? These videos might really help me strengthen my spine and have a better back. But so, no, no, no. So what I'm doing right now is working on my film. I made a film called Broken Bone Bathtub. It is about my show in a bathtub that I performed for six years all over the United States. I performed it in Japan. I performed it in Australia and Ireland and the UK. And I made this movie. I crowdfunded over $40,000. I raised an additional two grand to submit to film festivals. And I got rejected from every single film festival I applied for. It was 33 festivals. So what I'm doing now is working on the magical experience of putting together my own tour. And this is a really interesting and important thing. I, I do this. So with Broken Bone Bathtub, I performed a show out of people's homes. It was part of my my life, my livelihood, my my sense of adventure. It was everything. It's it's everything that I am. And doing this show has it has changed me as a person. And the film is all about the experience of this adventure of life on the road and performing in people's homes. I've loved it. I'm so proud of myself for doing it. However, obviously, the film didn't get anywhere. So I am engineering my own tour just as I did with the show itself. I'm now doing with the film where I'm soliciting folks to screen the documentary. And if they want to screen it, I'll essentially let them. And if they're interested in it, they, they can host it in their, in their living rooms, in their backyards. We can just have people over, charge a little bit of money for the tickets and host the show. And I'm very pleased to be doing this because I really want to celebrate the movie. I worked really hard on the movie and I want to put it out there into the world. Now, what you don't see is that I'm very, very full of low self-esteem regarding this project. I mean, getting rejected 33 times is embarrassing to say the least. It reminds you that you suck at things, that you're not good, you're not a good artist, you don't deserve to make money with your art, people don't want to exhibit your art, and it sucks and it hurts the brain and it makes you feel really sad. And so I'm just putting that out there to let, to just say that that is absolutely happening in my brain while I manage the production of this self-produced tour. Here's a little preview experience of my, my laptop. And actually what we're looking at here are the spreadsheet that I've made of, it's got, I think that's got 45 rows at this point with folks who are interested in either hosting, producing at a larger venue. Some, we'll be doing some independent theaters. And I am managing this spreadsheet because the emails have been pretty chaotic, taking a lot of meetings. There's a lot of conversations with potential thoughts and dates and ideas thrown around. Nothing is set in stone at this point, so I have to be paying very close attention to the work that I'm doing and making sure that I make a note if I've emailed someone or responded to someone so that I can remember to follow up and um, continue the you know um, conversation with folks. And one of these um, conversations that I'm going to be having is actually, um, it's with like a, a film festival. A film festival did reach out to me and it's the Nevada Women's Film Festival. And someone from my newsletter told them to read my, um, yeah, to read my, my email. 
and they requested that I submit to them. So I created a submission, which is exciting. Maybe I'll end up going to a festival because they waived the fee. They just were like, we'd love to, to present your work. Now I have had a fee get waived for me already for actually the Seattle Film Festival, which was incredible, but I still got rejected. So it doesn't really mean anything. And again, I think it's so, it's part of my life experience to not keep my hopes up about these things because I do tend to get really sad and feel overwhelmed and feel, you know, feel down about about my work and about who I am as a creative person. So I think that I am proud of myself for submitting. I did receive the request to submit and I'm grateful for that too. But yeah, I'm in a little bit of a weird space of like how I'm feeling about about all of this. So now we can make some lunch. I really want actors and independent artists and creatives to cook from home. Ordering food out is great, fun. It's super fun, but I'm very passionate about cooking and making my own food. Here's another view of my studio apartment so you can start to get a sense of the room and what it looks like. But yeah, so I'm making a salad. I am a vegan. I love a salad moment and I'm testing this. This is some feta actually, some cashew feta I got, I guess almost two weeks ago now. And you'll see that I'm like, oh, maybe it's, nope, that was gross. Okay, we are gonna throw it out. It went bad already. Vegan cheese goes bad really fast, really, really fast. And it's really hard to buy it as a, a single person living alone. My partner lives in New York City, so um, we're often not together. And you know, you gotta throw out the feta when it goes bad. So anyway. <laughs> That's what I'm doing, but I am cooking from home. I'm, you save money when you make your food at home. And when you work from home, you really ought to cook, cook from home because you can have your soups and sandwiches and salads and, that, and that's like a really nice thing. So, so yeah, so making, yeah, those gross, I'm like, ew. Um, also, part of my fast, I'm eating within the window of calories that I'm, I'm taking in the calories. It feels like a nice challenge as a creative to be doing this like fasting experience. But definitely as a vegan, I we love a salad moment and we love cooking. And so this is, yeah, this is just part of my, my practice here and part of my regular practice to make food from home. I, I also love leftovers though. I do have a giant pot of chili in the in the fridge and I eat that as well. But I try to switch it up so I'm eating different things each day. And it does. It feels like it feels like part of the experience of of what I do to to make food at home. What you don't see is like the stress I feel about like how much time it can take sometimes to make food. Like I don't really enjoy cooking as a person. It's more of like a practice of something I think I should do or ought to do or will do, but have to do, you know, that, that amalgamation of things. So yeah, it's a very precarious practice for me. I do it, but I get really stressed about how much work I have to do and how much work I haven't done. And sometimes I feel like food gets in the way, but I really do get so hungry. So, so here we are. And you know who else gets hungry actually? Well, that would be, that would be the plants. So we got to water the plants. We got to move things around. So there's my desk corner. You can see where I've got some art and some wonderful things. And then I've got a watering can where I need to take care of the plants. Um, some things that might be going through my head while I'm watering the plants. Definitely to-do lists. Uh, definitely trauma. Definitely thinking about uh, um, some sad things I've been through. Um, I've recently been through my family experienced a tragedy and maybe I'll open up more about that, but I I don't know if the if my YouTube and my 237 of you followers need to hear about my trauma at this point in time on this plat particular platform. But definitely thinking about tragedy and grief is a is something that's going through my head pretty constantly. I currently am not making any art based on this tragedy and grief. Not because I don't think I should or I, I don't know that I want to. Or I don't know that I ever will. It's not something this year is is very much about actualization for me. Oftentimes I'm I'm doing sort of I'm creating something. But, but more than that, I'm, I'm, working on, I'm working on actualizing. So I make things already, but I want those things to go out into the world, to be shared, you know, with others. And it's hard to do that. It's really hard as an artist to find ways to share your craft. So that's a lot of what the creative process is for me right now, as opposed to the new big thing that I am, that I'm 
currently you know, making or developing. Now, that being said, the plants are, I think, good for creativity. I think having living beings, even if you can't have a cat <laughs> or a dog, which I cannot have, I just can't take care of them. I wanted to give you this very cute tush shot because I have a very cute tush that you get to see here when I'm climbing up on my stepladder, watering various plants of mine in, in my home. And they are, they're wonderful. They're wonderful friends. They keep me company and I try my best to be someone who cares for plants. And then the salad is actually done. I put like a chickpea patty on it. So I've eaten the salad and now I actually ended up not being in full frame for this. But another part of a creative process is your creative community. So your friends and lovers, you all. And this is me sitting down. I'm really attractive, right? Very attractive person sitting down and listening to a recording that I cut because I wasn't in frame, but I'm listening to a very long, long recording that a friend of mine sent about the trauma of their film production. And I gotta say, making a film is so, 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 so hard. And one of my friends also a filmmaker, all of us are all filmmakers, but so they've made this film and they're having a very difficult time of with working with the team. And it is so common. And I sat there and I ate this salad and I listened, 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 listened. And it was just, painful and good to be supportive because I love my friend but oh my god it does feel um you're just so constantly reminded first of all that you're not alone you're not alone when you have trauma making your product like making it happen is so 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 hard but it's also like oh my god it's so sad to me that we all have to go through so much in order to make our products like genuinely unfair <laughs> creative people deserve better than any of us get and then what you're not seeing is my like three hour phone call with my friend Brandon, who is also producing my retreat, Please Do Vibe. I do run a creative retreat out of upstate New York and we did it once last year. We're doing it a second time this year and we talked for three hours just about the projects and life. And then I went to Target. I spent money I shouldn't have on random things like an adorable pink fanny pack and I unloaded the bags and then I got myself together because what I actually needed to do was start my evening project and my evening project is called unstructured play and unstructured play is my monthly meeting with my patrons on patreon patreon folks can join me on zoom once a month it's sort of like office hours it's basically like folks at a higher level tier of patreon get to check in with me more personally about what's going on with them how they're doing what they're thinking about what their lives are like and you know this is us just um hanging out and chatting the unstructured play team they are on at my highest tier of patreon called gluten-free girlfriends and gluten-free girlfriends can come in and just spend some really deliberate time catching up chatting and being fully fully present with me and you might see that my hands are busy doing something it's because I'm actually removing the press on nails I was wearing for two full weeks and they needed to go so I'm soaking my nails while I'm chatting with them and this time is really valuable to me I, I hope it's valuable to them it's very much about how I am gathering with my people the ways in which we are able to hear each other and have a very deliberate space for just ourselves it is not there's nothing, there's no agenda, there's no readings, there's no homework. It's a very important time for me to share with them as well as listen to them and hear about how each other is is doing and how everything is going. And of course, there are times where I give them updates on my life. Because nothing I do is ever, I mean, it, like I've been to like fringe festivals and, and like and like bars, do you know what I mean? I'm a ho, so I just perform in ho places and otherwise... You perform in a bathroom and you're like, that'll do. And I don't even ever look at it before I get there, which is also what we did with Outlier Inn was like, all right, cool. I'll check it out when I get there. It's not, I don't recommend it, but it is like what my life has been. And of course, why would I not share with you a full view of the soaking of my press on nails? I'm new to press on nails. It was a 2024 objective to um, try these. I am I'm hoping that someday my partner will propose to me. It hasn't happened yet, but I'm really hoping that that could potentially happen. Wink, wink. There's a chance that they are listening to this experience. <laughs> Just a chance. But anyway, so it did not happen with this set of nails. So I'm removing them. And what you do is you soak them in hot water and then you can kind of like, you can use a cuticle, cuticle file, cuticle tool. It's a tool that you can then push the nails off with. And it's a very strange process, but it feels, it feels a little bit like 
It's nice to do on these Zoom sessions. You can kind of, you can, if you're a fidgeter, if you're anxious like I am, it's actually a really productive thing to spend doing with your hands. And, you know, doing your own nails is very laborious, whether you're painting them or whether you're doing press-ons, but it does feel like a nice productive thing to do while you're sitting very still and listening to people and sharing space. So yeah, this was part of my unstructured play session, which by the way, it, it runs from 6 p.m. kind of Pacific time onward. And so I just, you know, let it go until folks are kind of done. And I needed to be done last night because I was very busy. I, about nine o'clock PM, I got my act together to start on my mailing list. So I have a newsletter. I'd love for you to subscribe to my newsletter. My newsletter is called The Glitter Jar. And in The Glitter Jar, I send updates, events, offerings, just let people know what is going on, you know, with me. And in this case, this is my first time doing this thing called A-B testing. Might seem kind of boring, but I'm just gonna share with you. I did my, I conducted my first A-B test this morning and I prepared the newsletter at around 9.30 last night. And it was a lot of, I mean, it's interesting, you know, it's like what, how it works. So this is me kind of putting together the newsletter. Like, okay, what is A-B testing and how does it work and what does it look like and what does it what does it mean? It means that there's many, many, many different avenues you can try, but I tried subject. So I tried a subject. I'm trying like to really gather data actually on my findings here. And so with the subject of this A-B testing, I essentially was like, okay, I used an emoji and I said the glitter jar. And then I was like, my Vaughn versus Apple, I think is what it was called because it's about a, it's about me advocating for myself at the Apple store, funnily enough. And part of that experience, so I, I, I bought a, a new iPad and it was deficient and then they charged me $50 for repairs and I essentially refused to pay for it. There's a whole other YouTube video about that if you want to check it out. It's in my Wink of Wisdom series. But so I was messing with the subject line and it, it essentially I sent it out to two different groups through MailChimp and they gathered the data through the A-B testing through those two different groups of the folks I that communicate most with me and open up my emails the most. And it was fascinating. What they then did was determine which got the most opens of that group within four hours of me sending the email out. And then they sent the same email out to the rest of my subscribers, the ones who open it less. So it's really, it's really interesting. And I'm glad I did it. It was like extra work to get done, but I'm super glad that I, that I did it today and that I made it something like a priority, like something I really needed to do. Now, normally, after I accomplish a task like this, finishing the email, scheduling it out, making sure all the links are correct, doing all of that labor, normally I would then do a TikTok live because I'm trying to, I'm trying to expand my, my labor on the internet. And the issue is that sometimes I am just freaking exhausted and I could barely send a coherent newsletter and I was nervous that the writing was bad. And I just decided like, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do the TikTok live. And usually after the TikTok live, I then write two letters in the mail to my patrons on Patreon because it's it's the quarterly moment and I send thank yous and, and lots of love and gratitude in the mail to my patrons on Patreon because I love them. This time that didn't, I just, I did not do that. Did not do it, didn't get around to it. I just couldn't, I couldn't do it. I was exhausted. And I'm not necessarily exhausted because of, you know, this day in particular. Many days I've struggled with sleeping because I'm, I'm dealing with a lot of grief and I'm sadness and sadness about myself. And, you know, I currently don't really have something that I'm really looking forward to on a calendar just yet. So I'm feeling, you know, I'm feeling like I need to go to bed. So, so this has been my, my day. I went to bed actually around midnight, which is very unique for me and very important. So thank you so much for joining me for my first official series on a day in the life of an independent creative. And I hope that this is something that maybe folks can resonate with or at least vibe with as I am always looking for more resonance and more vibing in my own life. So thanks for being with me. And I'll see you next week where I document another day of my creative journey and all of the various tasks that I do. Appreciate you so much and take it easy.